This is a test. Can you all hear me in the back? Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, good evening to all. L'heure est à la célébration et je suis ravie de vous accueillir ici ce soir. As Senegal Mayor, it is my honor to welcome you this evening to mark the start of the year-long celebration of our village's 125th anniversary. We are joined tonight by uh, past Mayor Jane Guest. Jane. Thank you for being here, and I know you're also part of the committee, so thank you. Uh, tonight is the first of a series of anniversary events that will continue throughout the year, including exhibitions, dinners, lectures, sporting events, and a gala that promises to be unforgettable. While Senneville beca became its own village 125 years ago, its history dates back to colonial times. Fur traders Charles Le Moine and Jacques Lebert acquired the territory in 1679 from a French nobleman. En 1686, Jacques Lebert fit construire un moulin de pierre entouré d'une palissade de bois, car les attaques des Iroquois étaient nombreuses à cette époque. C'est lui qui nomma l'endroit Seineville, du nom de sa commune natale en France, Seineville sur Fécamp. Une vingtaine d'années plus tard, son fils fit construire un fort de pierre dont on peut encore voir les ruines aujourd'hui. À cette époque, Seineville faisait partie de la paroisse qui s'appelait sainte anne du bout de l'île. C'est en 1895 que Seineville s'est détaché de sainte anne de bellevue pour se constituer en la corporation municipale du village de Seineville avec pour premier maire Louis-Joseph Forget. Although Seineville broke away from the parish known as saint anne de bouville 125 years ago to become its own separate village, our ties to saint anne de bellevue and Bédurfe remain strong. When Le Moine and Le Baire settled here, they could not have imagined that the land would become the vibrant, diverse, creative and community-focused village that it is today. Knowing how our village came to be, let's think about the people and the families that built it over time. At the turn of the last century, politicians, bankers, and merchants from Montreal joined forces with eminent architects and landscape architects to transform the old Seneville farms into sumptuous estates, drawing inspiration from the beautiful Lac des Deux Montagnes. C'est Sir John Abbott, futur premier ministre du Canada, qui a entraîné l'aménagement de part et d'autre du chemin Seneville de vastes propriétés qui ont fait Seineville l'un des principaux lieux de villégiature de l'élite canadienne du début du XXe siècle. Les propriétaires des domaines de Seineville étaient présidents, fondateurs ou directeurs de certaines entreprises commerciales les plus importantes de l'époque, y compris la Banque de Montréal et le Canadien Pacifique. One of the fears of any visionary planning a new community is that it will somehow lack spirit and heart. Not so in Seineville. The vision and ambition of the founders of this village is to be congratulated, as well as so many of you who have made Seineville the wonderful place that it is today. One of the most impressive things about Seineville is that no one lives more than a stone's throw from a green space. An example of wonderful foresight and planning that continues to be a priority. Today, Seineville is a diverse and, diverse and thriving village with a strong sense of community and belonging. Nous sommes une communauté tissée serrée et nos citoyens s'investissent pour faire de notre village un lieu unique. J'aimerais d'ailleurs prendre l'occasion pour remercier très sincèrement tous les bénévoles extraordinaires qui offrent généreusement leur temps et leur talent pour organiser les célébrations du 125e anniversaire et je vais les nommer. Doreen Kroll, James Fraser, Jane Guest, Jim Hamilton, Patricia Jackson, Myrna McLean, Liz Morgan, Diane No, Denise Palisitis, Julie Sauvé, Monica Savage, Maureen Tanner, and Vicki Whale. <laughs> In Seineville, we love get-togethers. 
Thanks to you, it will be the year of get-togethers. <laughs> While times have changed since Jacques Lebert built this stone windmill, some things have remained constant. We care about the history of our village and use the past to guide us forward. I have no doubt that the village will continue to thrive over the next 125 years and beyond. Let the ceremonies begin. All right. Merci, Madame Pichbois. Bonjour, bonsoir. Je m'appelle Vicky Ward. De la part du comité du 125e anniversaire, je vous souhaite la bienvenue à cette soirée pour célébrer avec nous les 125 années de Seineville comme village distinct. Good evening, my name is Vicky Wild. On behalf of the 125th anniversary committee, we welcome you. Thank you. My name is Vicki Wild. <laughs> On behalf of the 125th Anniversary Committee, we welcome you this evening to celebrate with us 125 years of Seneville as a separate village. Please take note of the Sorti exits. And please turn off your cell phones. The presentation is being filmed for the archives of Seneville, and we hope they will be able to be online for your viewing. I grew up in Seneville in an historic house designed by the well-known Montreal architects, Edward and William Sutherland Maxwell. The house was designed and built for Guy and Blanche Boyer. Blanche was a daughter of Senator Forget. I was surrounded by Seneville's history. My friends and neighbors were all descended from the first families of Seneville or were connected to them in some way. For this anniversary, friends and associates have been contacted and all have been most eager to participate and contribute in any way to the upcoming events and to Seneville's historical record. The committee would like to thank our coordinator, Doreen Kroll, who with her vision, energy, organizational abilities, and talent for bringing a team together has made possible the wonderful year ahead. We thank the mayor, the council of the village of Seneville, and Geneviève Fournier for all their help in the planning and execution of the 125th celebration. Merci au maire, au conseil municipal du village de Sainte-Ville et à Geneviève Fournier pour l'aide dans la planification et la réalisation des célébrations du 125e anniversaire. Thank you to all the volunteers who have worked with great enthusiasm to prepare for all these celebrations. Several events have been planned throughout the year. The lecture series will be one of our shining contributions to the Seneville historical record. The lectures will approximately last an hour and be mostly in English. We have set aside an hour for questions and shared anecdotes that can be in either language. Please use the microphone provided and please join us for coffee and refreshments afterwards. The next lecture in the series, The Morgan Family and Le Sabo, will be given by Liz Morgan and Bruce Russell on Tuesday, February 18th at 7 p.m. here at the George McLeish Community Center. The latest version of the calendar of events will be handed out to you as you leave this evening. Updates will be on the website, Info Senville, or sent by committee members to their various contacts. <coughs> One of the lasting jewels of the 125th anniversary committee's efforts will be the new edition of Ms. Mrs. Bridget Fiorkowski's book, Je Me Souviens. Mm. Biddy as we knew her, 
was the granddaughter of Sir Edward Seaborn Clouston. The family home was Webb de Young. In the early 1970s, a lifelong interest in Quebec history inspired Benny, Biddy to interview some of Centerville's oldest families. She has captured a fascinating look at life in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and so has documented for us a look at our village's past. Sincère remerciement à ceux qui ont rendu possible cette merveilleuse nouvelle édition. To those who contributed to make this beautiful edition possible, a sincere thank you to Le Village de Seineville, Peter Filkowski, Blackie Chase, Marianne Roy, Gordon Erskine, Melanie Johnson, Johnny Chevalier, John Angus, Lucie Crevier, Joe Barclay, Ethel and Sylvie Seguin, Grégoire Crevier, Roger and Francis Legault, Donnie Ryan, David and Jean Marler, Liz Morgan, Leo Vio, Doreen Kroll, Geneviève Fournier, Joanne and Suzanne O'Malley. Copies of the book will be available after the lecture for $16. It can also be purchased at Town Hall, 35 Centerville Road. Please have cash or checks made out to the Village de Centerville. I would now like to introduce you to my colleague and my dear friend, Marianne Bois, who is a great granddaughter of Senator Forget. Je vous présente maintenant ma collègue et chère amie, Marianne Roy, l'arrière petite fille du sénateur Louis-Joseph Forget. Merci, thank you. Wow. J'ai été très contente d'apprendre que Gordon Erskine serait le premier conférencier de cette année de célébration du 125e anniversaire de Seineville. Gordon est un gars de la Pointe, la Pointe Saint-Charles. He was born in the working class district of Pointe Saint-Charles in Montreal. However, he finished high school in Sudbury, received a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Toronto, then a PhD from University College at the University of London, England. Il a fait de la recherche et enseigné à Londres, Cambridge, l'Université de Queen's à Kingston, ainsi qu'aux Philippines. Puis, après 35 ans d'enseignement au cégep John Abbott, Gordon a pris sa retraite. So before adopting Centerville in 1999 as his home, Gordon was also a man of the world. Gordon has been a member of the Brayside Golf Club for almost 20 years. He was president in 2010 when he finished the work on his book that I forgot my copy of at home. But I hope you have some copies of here and I'm to show it to you. It's à peu près au même moment que je l'ai rencontré lors de la, la première fois, lors de l'Assemblée générale des membres du terrain de golf Centerville, Centerville Golf Links, réunion à laquelle il est aussi devenu membre de son conseil d'administration comme représentant de Brayside. During the golfing season, you can find Gordon on the course around 6 a.m. as the sun rises. He told me that every morning as he arrives, the world fades away and a sense of peace enfolds him. Ce n'est donc pas surprenant que son livre merveilleux fut un travail d'amour. It is no wonder then that his wonderful book entitled Golfing in the Garden, The History of Centerville Golf Links and Brayside Golf Club was truly a labor of love copies of which, by the way, I think, are available for sale here tonight. Vous pouvez donc vous en procurer une copie. This history and presentation will also give you an excellent grounding for many of the other talks to come over the next year. Je vous présente Gordon Erskine.
Well, thank you very much for those uh, very kind words, Marianne. I really appreciate it. Now, I would rather not use the microphone if I can get away without it. So, can you hear me at the moment? Yes. yes. You're okay at the back? Um, I'll carry this for a few minutes, and if you find you can hear me, then I'll, I'll talk into the mic, but I would, I would prefer uh, not to. Uh, it's um, it's my intent to deal and talk uh, a lot about the early history of the families uh, who set up the great states in the late 19th century. Um, after I've done that, I'll speak more specifically about uh, Grayside. Um, not just because I love the place and I'm there every morning just about and playing golf and it's beautiful, um, but because it represents um, the last remaining direct link between the four families and uh, Centerville and to each other, as you'll see. It's, a, it's something that ties them together in a way that was not there before. Um, of course, down at the bottom, you see the real reason is that I love golfing in the garden of Eden. That sort of um, was the inspiration for the book. So I, I just removed the Eden of Eden at the end and said, I'll just call it golfing in the garden. I'm going to talk mainly about maps and how they how they gave me the information that I, that I needed to have. Um, in 1834, the western tip of the island of Montreal did not have a lot of specific uh, places mentioned, as you can see. There, um, there's the Paros de Saint Anne, and then you have the two areas called the Fiche Senville, um, with very little in between except trees, which is, of course, often from the day. St. Anne's, of course, has been around for a long time. When I saw this, I'm, I know, of course, there were other buildings, and we can see uh, up here. I've only got, oh, got two hands and three things to operate over here. Uh, Fort Centerville up here, of course, was, was uh, and that comes back from the 1700s. But there was very little, there's no um, separate lots and so on mentioned and so at this stage. So when I saw this, it sort of, that it's like a place that anticipates change. It's like a, a, a blank sheet, and it could not stay that way, as you would guess. Now, the right way, I am. Fast forward to 1879, and you see now that all of the, the whole area is now divided into lots, belong to different people, and it's here that we see an awful lot of the names that are still Common around Senegal in the area today. You see the, the Lalonde and the uh, Hulot, uh, Wobia, Brunei. Um, and I'm interested at this stage in three particular properties that I'll probably return to uh, because they're of, they're of interest to me. One is the f farm that belonged to a Mr. Nicolas Claude here. Um, there was land that was owned on the waterfront by Mr. Wotherspoon, and I must confess, I could not find out very much about anything at all, frankly, about Mr. Wotherspoon. I don't know what, um, <coughs> what the background was, and, and of course, as you'll see, um, the name disappears very quickly. And of course, the other interesting place that I'm interested in is the land that was acquired by the Sir John Hurd. Okay, so I'm going to focus on those a little bit. So in 1865, uh, Sir John Abbott, who, as you know, many of you will know anyway, that he was our very reluctant third prime minister. And in a way, you can see why. Um, he bought this 325-acre plot of land. And I was just told tonight, I didn't know this before, that it was probably bought from the Robillard family. Um, and he proceeded then to operate a farm. It was a, quite an extensive farming operation. It's quite clear that as soon as spring came in the summer, the last place he wanted to be was downtown Montreal. And he operated the farm for a good 
20 years, so he was not an absentee landlord. He was, just, he was very much, uh, very much involved. He built a very fine mansion, and uh, in 1875, or this was a picture, it was in 1875, um, which he whimsically called Wabrion. I think he, he had to have a little bit of a, a sense of humor to say, well, oh, I got this nice big house, I'm gonna give it a name like uh, a lot of other people do for this sort of thing. <coughs> Then things began happening very quickly after that. Um, he had a, he operated his farm in secrecy. He, he was there all by himself, as it were, for a long period of time. But working downtown in Montreal, you can bet that the word got out that, you know, what's Sir John doing out there on the western tip of the island? And it wasn't long before a number of other very wealthy men decided We've got to find a place for our family to go in the summer. Montreal in the summer is an awfully unpleasant place to be. It's hot and it's dirty and it's not very nice. And so the first person to move out was Sir uh, was Richard Angus. And uh, R.B. Angus in 1886 bought the land that it was previously Mr. Wotherspoon's land. And this was on the, on the water beside the Abbott farm. And he proceeded to build a house called Kind Love. And I'm not sure, I think this is the original house, um, it, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, it, uh, it burned down uh, shortly after, it didn't last very long. And then another house was built on the same property um, by the Maxwells as well. Uh, and unfortunately, it too has been destroyed. And uh, as many of you know, there is currently um, activity on the land now to build another considerable house, and uh, it's of considerable interest to a Senegal town council, I think, at the moment. Uh, R.B. Angus was a prominent officer in the Bank of Montreal, and he also played a, a as we heard from Vicky, I think, earlier, a prime part in the building of the Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, he was also a, a considerable philanthropist for the city of Montreal. Um, another area where he and his wife contributed, they had six daughters, one of whom died in childhood, and three sons. So when they moved out into the summer, it was quite a troop that they that came out to enjoy the summer. Okay. Next, in the in line here, is that James Morgan Jr., James Morgan II, uh, proceeded, and he, uh, he was very keen. He bought a lot of land in the area. Uh, in particular, what he did was to, for his own estate, was he bought the piece of the land right near the edge of the Claude Farm. And if I can just show you just very quickly, you'll see up in the, oh, where's my pointer? There it is. Uh, this plot of land here, right across Center Mill Road, the road from the Claude Farm, is where James Morgan II uh, built his, uh, his mansion. It's called Grace Names, and it, it lies directly across the road from Grayside, and you can still see a large part of the house, the trees, particularly what we're interested in here is the, the rounded turrets, which is characteristic of Maxwell's architecture. Uh, and so we have two of the three. What happened next was quite cataclysmic in a way. So John Abbott died in 1893, and his huge estate, the farm, was broken up and sold, and it was bought primarily by R.B. Angus, um, by Sir Edward Clouston, and um, who was the other member that I'm thinking of here? By the... Uh, no, the Senator Forshaw didn't buy, buy sold. R.B. Angus, um, oh, and... Yeah. 
So what I'm going to show you next is the uh, Louis Forget, Senator Forget, bought the Forget family, <laughs> proceeded then to buy a large section of the land that started at Mont Salon and all the way down to the Morgan mm -hmm. property. So we can see what's happening if we look ahead now to the 1907, things are consolidated, <laughs> and I'm going to show you the bits and pieces of the, the Passano map of 1907, just to give you an idea of the extent of the property. So this is in the north, and we have, uh, the wrong thing here. This is the, this is an Salon up here. So coming down from the north, you have uh, sections that were bought by Senator Forget on both sides of Senator Road. The section here on the right, of course, is now the, the uh, Parc Agricole de, de Port de la Roche. And he built uh, two houses. The first one burned down, but then he built Bois de la Roche in about 1904. And uh, so he had much, much of the land uh, on the north section up there. Coming a little farther south from that, Coming a little farther south, uh, we meet then the Morgan land that was uh, bought by James Morgan II. And we see here, we see here that this is the estate where Greystains is, where James Morgan II's house. Um, this is the whole Claude, the Claude farm, which now, interestingly, is now surrounded by, by Morgan land and by Angus land, because if we come down a little farther, a little farther south, we see that we have R.B. Angus, R.B. Angus bought a lot of the property, and many of the, the people like Charles Meredith and the Wankins, they are um, um, businessmen who married daughters of the, uh, the Angus family, and as each daughter married, uh, they built their own cottage. Know what those cottages can look like. <laughs> Not what most of them would call cottages, but they were either they were they were built partly by the by the husbands, but I think R.B. Angus contributed very handsomely uh, presents and gifts to his to his daughters. And then in the south we have the uh, uh, Sir Edward Clouston bought the southernmost part, containing Fort Centerville, and also. Uh, the uh, Bois Briand, the, 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 the mansion that, uh, that uh, uh, John Abbott had built. Mm -hmm. The Abbott family had, was a large family, but very few uh, of the descendants are actually married and had children. So the, the line, you didn't have too many of the Abbots left, but two of the Abbott boys stayed behind. And you can see Arthur Abbott, who was here, retained a bit of the Abbott estate there. And the John Bethune Abbott, who was one of the J.D. Abbott, bought the property here uh, that was part of the Abbott, uh, part of the Abbott estate. And just to situate it, this is the, the hill that all the cyclists love. <laughs> and of course, there's a road coming in here to the to Um The top of the hill here, there's a beautiful white colonial style mansion, which is often misidentified as the, um, as J.B. Abbott's house. J.B. Abbott had built a house that was called Hillcote, but when um, Herbert Meredith Marler bought that house in the 1920s, he built this the mansion that stands there today. So it, it's, a, it's a Marler house, not, a, not an Abbott house. Okay. So what I want to look at, this is very hard to read, but I wanted to show the, the overall extent of the land. So if you look at the whole section, the, the four families at this stage own all the land stretching from Ossalon all the way down to the edge of um, St. Anne Street, down to the, where, the, where, where Fort Center is. So it was, it was an extensive um, set of properties. Okay. And they enjoyed it immensely. Um, the families, this is, this is a little bit like Senegal's Downton Abbey. Right? Um, 
the um, <coughs> we have here on the left is we have uh, Sir Edward uh, Clouston and uh, Sir Vincent Meredith and another uh, Mrs. Meredith there, and they, if you look closely, you'll see the golf bag that is strung over Sir Edward's uh, shoulders there. They thought they're just going to or just coming from golf. Um, the center picture is at uh, Boisbriand. Again, it's Mrs. Clouston there and Marjorie Clouston, Osmond Clouston, and Sir Edward Clouston in, in front of the house. And I think that's Mickey the dog, I think. That, <laughs> And the house on the right is a is the the, the uh, roadside view of Pine Bluff, um, the the Angus house at that in that early period. This is the dock at um, Pine Bluff. So they in the summers the young people and and their friends and their parents and their friends. It was quite a big gathering. Had just everything at their disposal. They play tennis, they can go sailing, and undoubtedly, the Angus clan being Scots, of course, thought we should play some golf. I think is what we should be doing here, and they, they did so. Now these photographs are uh, part of a very beautiful collection. Um, over here on the, uh, on the right, over here on the right, is, uh, that's Marjorie, uh, Clouston, and she's got the Kodak camera, and that's, I think, is Gwendolyn Howard. And it was Gwendolyn Howard who, uh, who had an early Kodak, and she was very close friends with the Clouston girls, and she was often invited to the parties and so on, and the weekends and so on during the summer. So she took a whole host of photographs, and if you go online, just Google the Gwendolyn Marjorie Howard collection, Howard Kutcher collection, and there's this wonderful um, set of photographs which you can see it's available, available online. I just want to return now, I want to talk about the genesis of the of Brayside Golf Club. And I just want to um, echo what's happening here. Remember the clothes man here and the Morgan <coughs> estate there. And the uh, the clothes land by now, of course, is totally surrounded by uh, totally surrounded by the Morgan land and the Angus land and so on. And it was a logical place. If you were going to play golf, this is this is where that you would do it. So it's always an interesting speculation when golf was actually played uh, in, in Senegal. And some of the best evidence, apart from direct documentation, um, we do have direct documentation of land formally leased from Nicola Claude in, in 1897. Um, but the two, the best pieces of evidence are two trophies that were made and, uh, or had, were made by um, a Mr. Laurie, who was an art dealer from London, who was visiting the Angus uh, property, the Angus, the Angus family, and he presented two major trophies for competition. Now, you, it's very difficult to present trophies for competition if you don't have a competition. And to have a competition, you need to have organization. And with organization, you've got to have someone who says, oh, you, you've been playing golf here for a couple of summers. Why don't we do the proper thing, like the big golf courses, and we'll have our own competition, which they proceeded to do. Uh, and the trophies were going to be the Laurie Cup and the Laurie Medal for the ladies. And both of these were presented for the first time in 1898. Okay, and the winner of the first of the, of the, uh, the cup was uh, Arthur Abbott, and of the, of the medal was Peggy Angus. The, um, the gold medal, which is the, the actual original gold medal, is just at the bottom of the, of the set that are there. And the names inscribed on the back, well, the name there was 1898 is Peggy Angus, the youngest daughter of Richard Angus. And every winner since then has been inscribed on the pieces of gold that have been added to it over the years. So both sides have the names of all of the, all of the ladies who, who won the medal in a particular year. Now, what this suggests is that golf was play, being played almost certainly by 1897, and even maybe even as early as 1896, which is interesting because it gives Brayside 
a reasonable claim to be the oldest private golf course in Canada that's still in the same place. Right? Um, most of the major golf courses, major golf courses, of course, could not afford to stay in the same place as they were found because the land became too valuable. But Grayside, the golf course, is such a magical place. Like, when I first began playing there, I said, how can this place exist? Nobody knows about it. Nobody <laughs> seems to have an idea where this is. A good friend of mine, Norm Nickington, said it. I was flying over in my plane, and I saw down there a golf course. Well, John, as some of you know, he can't see a golf course without wanting to play on it, and so he actually found it that way. But it's really quite extraordinary. This, um, this golf course is... It's very magical for me, um, but it is a very unique place, and given its history and the way it's set up. Okay. Here are some, this is a picture. This is uh, uh, Peggy Angus and, and Lulu Skinner, who was uh, the eldest daughter of, of Senator Forget, um, playing golf. And I look at that grip she's got in the club, I think she might have been left-handed. <laughs> what is interesting, of course, is how could they play golf wearing those dresses? And, but I, I played tennis in them as well, so it's, a, it's just part of what you did. I don't think the ladies today would be <laughs> very keen about wearing these skirts. This is a, a photograph, uh, that's uh, Sir Edward Clouston outside the cart and Marjorie, his daughter, the other two were not identified. And you can just see the golf clubs just sort of sticking out of the end of the cart. So they've either just going to golf or they've just come, just come from golf. This is Bertha Angus, and she was married to Matthew Patterson, so Bertha Patterson. She doesn't look too happy about being a little bit more on that day. Whatever the date of the, when, when it was first played, uh, golf was first played at, at, uh, at Grayside, the land was in fact formally bought in 1901. They went to the Nicola Club and they offered um, to buy the land. And it's interesting that if you look at the shape, the red shape shows you the parts that they were buying. And if you here, and if you, just have a quick look at the, the, the aerial view. You'll see that the shape of the course and the shape of that red thing are very similar. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Now, there's also a, if you look down here, the Morgan estate, James Morgan was here at Grace Lanes, and right across the road were three lots that he had bought in his wife's name in 1892. And you'll see down here, there's a little structure and it's got written on a clubhouse. And it's quite clear to me that the families would make their way from their various homes and so on, cross over Senegal Road, pick up their clubs here at the clubhouse, and then play golf on the farm itself. The cost of the land was $7,800. And it would, the money was raised by subscription from members of the four families at $100 a certificate. And so there were 78 certificates, and as you might guess, the bulk of them were bought by the Angus clan. There were more of them, and I think they had a bigger uh, connection to golf anyway, so the Morgans, the Angus has picked up most of the, most of the cost of it. Now this was a game changer. If you realize that the families, the four families, enjoyed a lot of things together, no question. They had parties, and they were silly, and so on. It was great. But once they had bought the land jointly, they were now tied together. The, the, the way, the, the, way the, the land was bought out, you'll see in a moment how the, how the um, bylaws were structured. Um, the, the families became tied together because they couldn't independently, as a family, get rid of the land, sell it or whatever, they were tied together. Uh, and, I'll, I'll jump ahead here a little bit. In the articles of the, the first articles of how it was going to be run, each, the, the certificates, 
the shares in the commune could only be sold to members of the four families. Right? Um, and, and, and they had to be ratified, so that's one rule. Secondly, no matter how many shares you had, you only had one vote. So you could have 10 shares, but you only had one vote. And the really key one is that the only way the land could be sold was by a unanimous vote of all shareholders, which, if you can just imagine, put a law <laughs> on the land being preserved. Uh, John Angus often said to me that um, he believed that his great-grandfather, Richard Angus, had a firm belief he wanted that land to be green space forever. Okay? And this was one way to make it more possible than it might be otherwise. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting way of structuring things. Okay, so the land was the land was purchased, and they began playing golf. Uh, they had to get permission from the town of Senegal, of course, which had been formed, you know, formulated, as we know, in 1895. And this is the letter um, that has all the original shareholders here and signed by the secretary treasurer of the town at the same time. They then had to get permission from the provincial government to form this. And this was, a, this was the minutes of the first, uh, the minutes of, the, um, of what is called, at this time, Senegal Golf Links. Okay? And this is important, because you'll see that uh, names do make a difference. So we have here the minutes of the incorporators of the Senegal Golf Links, okay, so that was the original name, of course, was Senegal Golf Links, held at the office of um, Meredith or certainly there. And here are the names of all of the original uh, holders, and all of them were part of the family, with the exception of James Bryce Allen. James Bryce Allen was a son of, of Hugh Allen, or Andrew Allen, sorry, and uh, he was obviously very uh, good friends with the Clouston girls because he was he uh, spent a lot of time there, and he was one of the original uh, shareholders. And uh, in fact, he never married. And when he died, and all the, all of his shares went to the Clouston uh, daughters. Okay. All right. You'll notice that this is a, um, a copy of one of the original certificates of stock. Okay. Now, this is where words become important. It's quite clear that the families were having a bit of fun. I mean, let's make a company, and we'll have a golf course, but it's going to be a company. We'll do it properly, we'll have shares, and so on, and we'll get it formalized in law and everything, and now each of us has a stock. As businessmen, they would have understood stocks very, very well. Uh, but the use of the term stock uh, will have some problems later on, as, as we'll see. But this is everybody who bought stocks who has got one of these, uh, one of these uh, certificates for their, their stock. This is a, the first T. I always choose this, the, the, the stone wall. The stone wall, of course, that's there now is much prettier than the one that was there. Because you can see, you can see the, the residual parts of the Claude farm uh, just in the background there. And I, I think that this is what this represents. And that's a fine looking swing. Of course, if you're going to have a golf club, you've got to have a clubhouse. And I'm indebted to Ms. Morgan for this. was the very, very, the very first thing I obtained when I decided. I want to find out where this golf course comes from. I, I was so curious to know, and I was put in touch with Liz and went over to her place, and she said, oh yeah, I've got this, I've got this photograph, so I took, a, I took a copy of it, so I thank Liz for, A, getting me started with that, and also putting me in touch with John Angus, who very kindly gave me complete access to a huge trove of documents that relate to the families and to Graceland. So the, um, the clubhouse was built actually in 1904. There was a subscription taken up, another few thousand dollars were uh, 
were, were, were raised. There were another 30 certificates, and most of those were also bought by the Angus clan. And the, um, the original clubhouse, which you see there, this was during 1916 troop maneuvers and so on during the winter, because no golf was played at, at Ray Sidon during either of the World, uh, world Wars. But that clubhouse lasted for a better part of 100 years, and then unfortunately, in an act of probably inadvertent vandalism, was burned down in 1994. But very shortly after, it was rebuilt, and from a distance, you would be hard pressed to see any difference between the current clubhouse and what you see there. So it was the, the clubhouse was restored in 1995. Okay. okay. This is the uh, the competition for the Lorry Cup and the Lorry Medal for 1911, and it's interesting to show to see. Uh, who is playing? And again, I believe I have this organized and so on. So you see the Abbots are uh, represented, uh, Angus, the Chipman was another part of the Angus clan, um, uh, Miss Houston, uh, Miss Forger, the uh, Lily Forger, um, Pauline Forger. Um, initially, only family members uh, were members of the club and their and they also have had their immediate friends and so on. So uh, membership at the, at the golf club was restricted to what we call North Centerville, you see, and, 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 and family members. And you'll see that the Abbots are represented. J.B. Allen was there. Donald uh, Phillips Angus was there. You see one or two quite good golfers. So, and, and the, uh, so I suspect they were members of Wellman at all or something because they, their strat uh, Arthur Abbott, for instance, who won the Lorry Cup for the first time, was clearly a scratch golfer. You see it, his name was a scratch golfer. And, uh, and John Abbott as well, um, and Charles Meredith down there. Interestingly enough, uh, you notice the, it was Mrs. Skinner I had a very low handicap. Mm -hmm. Now, what's in the name? The players never thought of it as Senegal Golf Links. Mm -hmm. See, right away, right at the top, Senegal Golf Club. Okay? People didn't call it Senegal Golf Links. They began to think of it as Senegal Golf Club. And that can be a bit of a, a, bit of a problem, as we'll see. Mm -hmm. Now, before I delve into a little more into, into the golf course. Um, I want to show you something. Not some people have seen this, but not everyone. Things began to change. 1911, 1912, Sir Everett Houston died, and also um, Senator Forget died. Uh, the other, James Morgan and, and uh, and Richard Angus were still alive, but there was a seismic shift here. And quite clearly, something was going on. Because around 1913, this very classy brochure appeared. 16 pages of a brochure talking about a new development. Well, this is not Senegal on the Park. This is, this is, this is Senegal Grove. And in this brochure, so can you, all, all of the families had to have been involved because their houses are shown in this, in this brochure. And what it was, there was, uh, was going to be, a, as you see, a new and delightful residential subdivision, mm -hmm. uh, a very high class one, very discreet. Um, it was going to have wonderful avenues where you could go and drive your carriage. There was going to be sailing and tennis and so on and so forth. And amongst all of the grand claims, the Sylvan Lakes, all the houses were going to be houses on one acre estates, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, was the statement that accessibility, and I'll draw your attention to the statement that's made up here. There are about 60 trains daily <laughs> from St. Anne to downtown, the fastest train being at straight 25 minutes and the slowest being 45 minutes. That would eat your heart out, eh? It's really, 
it's hard, it's hard to believe, but I, I, I'm assuming that that was in fact the case. The, um, the brochure was the work of a, a very prominent real estate developer, a fellow named John Mayer, M-A-H-E-R, from Montreal, and he had enlisted the, uh, the um, very wisely, I think, the help of Frederick Todd, who was related to the family, that he was a landscape architect. So the two of them working together had developed this brochure. And uh, so in 1913, things were beginning to move. Well, of course, then came 1914, and we all know what happened in 1914. And after the war, it was never, never raised again. It's interesting. Before I leave that, I'll show you the scope of it. The proposal, the land would start down here south of the Yacht Club. Because one of the houses shown in the copy that I had, which was a photocopy, but it was noted, it came from John Lemieux, and it said, John, this is your house here, you see? So there, and it involved all of the property, all the way up to the Bay Fulton. So there's a lot of property there, and clearly a lot of discussion about what should be done. But nothing came of it. But I still think 20 or 30 trains a day or 60 trains a day into downtown Montreal is pretty good. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to ask you to indulge me in my favorite topic, and that is talking about the golf course. It's, to me, it's just fascinating people getting together and doing things and so on, and if you're not careful, you can have problems. So, what's in the name? So initially, of course, we saw that it was bought in the name of Senegal Golf Links. Senegal Golf Links bought the land. But then everyone began thinking of it as Senegal Golf Club. Now, as an operating golf club, um, they were submitting tax returns and so on. Um, but it turned out that we're Tax returns are going in under the name of Senegal Golf Club. Brayside is not mentioned though. I'll see where the, where, the, where the term comes up later. And at this stage, there was beginning to be a awareness of the necessity of separating out those people who played golf and those people who owned the property. And this is an important distinction. And interesting enough, at one of the meetings of the, of the Senegal Golf Links, the secretary was ordered, or asked, depending on how it was phrased, to draw up a lease, you see, which would formally rent the land uh, to Senegal Golf Club by Senegal Golf Links, showing that there's a distinction between the two. But it was never done. And after all, everybody knew everybody else, and it was a lot of bother to do this kind of thing, so let's not worry about it. And everything was good, until there was a new golf course suddenly appeared in the neighborhood. Around 1920, 1925, the Senegal Golf and Country Club. Uh, this particular copy that I made came from the, the big uh, graphic that used to be in the town council chamber. I just took a photograph of one, of one portion of it. And just to situate it, over here is where the water line is, where the small park is. And this was the property. Um, and not only was it a new golf course, it was a major golf course. It was uh, full 18 holes. It was, it was beautifully designed. And it was well enough regarded so that it was the, used for the Quebec Open at least twice in the, in the early 1930s. So it was quite substantial. But the problem for, for Braceside for the golf course was it was submitting returns as Senegal Golf Club. Senegal Golf and Country Club. And somebody, somebody in the government one day <laughs> realized that there was, this by the way is, um, is an aerial view in 1965 when Highway 40 was going, was, was going through. And you can see here again is the water. There's the water line. So there's the golf course. And you can see that when the road went through, it largely broke, if you think of it, land either side, that the golf course was cut in half. Okay, now, the problem was, of course, is that the, 
The Rachel Guffman discovers the golf course in 1937, as it were, as putting it, it's the Senegal Golf Club, but there's another Senegal Golf Club. And it turned out that investigation, as governments will do from time to time, showed that Senegal Golf Club just didn't exist. Somebody was submitting tax returns for something that didn't exist. And this was, it, it's sort of comical, except that it would have direct consequences if it wasn't fixed, because, as you know, bureaucracies don't like this kind of thing. And whenever you, think, whenever, uh, you have a, a decision to be made, if it went the wrong way, the land would revert to the provincial government. That's the problem, even though it seems like nothing on paper. Now, fortunately, um, they, uh, the government of the day was amenable to say, oh yeah, we can see what the issue is here. And so the club said, look, look, we'll, we'll submit, it's really Senegal Golf Links, okay, and that's a, that, that is a, a legal body and so on. So they started to do that. Unfortunately, as I put up there, but not always, is that it didn't take long for whoever was submitting the returns to him, you know, and wrote down Senegal Golf Club because, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, you don't care. Interestingly enough, the first mention of Brayside doesn't occur until about 1927. Again, it was in this effort to distinguish between uh, the people who own the course and the people who played on the course. And so basically, there was this letter from uh, Arthur Abbott to Frederick Wynton that's, that's defined. They said, the property stands in the name of Senegal Golf Links and is rented to Senegal Golf Club, Grayside Links. So there's where the term Grayside comes in, uh, for the nominal sum of $1 per annum, which however is never to be paid. Uh, but the club does pay all the taxes, insurance, and water rate, and maintains the property. So, with that particular problem solved, everybody was happy, and so people continued to play um, into the 30s and 40s. And now we see a little change in the, um, the wearing apparel. The people in some ways, very nice that the clubhouse is there. And we have here one more trophy that was produced uh, about this time. And it, it was to honor Joseph and William Beaulieu who were the only groundskeepers for almost the first 100 years of the course, father and son. And so the trophy, the Beaulieu Trophy for the champion golfer of the year um, was, uh, was created for them. Now time passes in the 30s and the 40s and so no golf played during the World War and so on. But what happens is that the shares or the, the stocks or whatever, began to be moved to, to other people in the family. So you lose track of who has what. And um, in two of the Angus estates, um, the, they became, they became just languished. They stopped were part of the settlement and they ended up in the estate. And I guess nobody wanted them particularly, so they ended up in the estate. And um, there was a, uh, enough confusion is that the, the golf club decided to hire Stackman Elliott, well, I guess it, Hubert Stackman, of course, who was a member of the club, um, and, and Stackman Elliott concluded, they wrote a quite a long document to sort out what, what was actually happening, and they concluded that, once again, Senegal Golf Club didn't exist, but we already knew that, but I think it was still appearing on tax returns. I think there was an issue here. Um, but the bigger problem, which nobody had anticipated, was that Senegal Golf Links itself was in imminent danger of just disappearing. You know? And if it did, then the land would revert to the provincial government. You know, for sure. Now the first part was resolved in 1950, early 1950s, 53, um, again with the agreement from the Attorney General of Quebec. What they did was to make Senegal Golf Links disappear, right? And, sorry, they kept the Senegal Golf Links, but made Senegal Golf Club disappear, and instead created a new body, which was now called the Brayside, Brayside Golf Club Corporation. So it's no problem. And we just noticed in passing that one of the, one of the directors 
And the main one well, that was Patrick was John Turner. Uh, he was a leader, part of the Prime Minister of Denmark. So but what about Senegal Dolphins? Here's the problem. The club was not incorporated. They they were pretending it was incorporated. It was a funny thing to do to them. We're in court corporation and we have stocks and some of the words we use. But it was never incorporated under corporate law. It was in fact set up under what was called the Amusement Act to create a golf club under the Amusement Act, <clears throat> which is okay, except that no provision in the bylaws was made for new members. And the Amusement Act law said that, well, if you've got a club and all the members die, the club ceases to exist and all of the accoutrements then become provincial property. At this stage, there were only two original certificate holders that are still alive, one of whom was, was Frederick Cleveland Morgan, who it wasn't clear whether he would be allowed to claim it, being a member either, because <coughs> his, his certificates were actually in trust from his father at the time. But he could have, he probably could have voted. But there was only one person, therefore, Dr. Douglas Morgan, who remained of the original of the original certificate holders, and he was living in Monaco. Now, the resolution of the problem has its whimsical aspects. It was, it's really quite, you have a picture of this, um, and it just seems like hanging by a thread at this stage. So, Dr. Morgan held a meeting by himself. <laughs> <laughs> he was the chairman of the meeting, he was the recording secretary, he, he voted unanimously for all the resolutions. And this is all John has, John Angus has the, do the document written up, all the minutes are written up in there. So that being, being the secretary and the treasurer and, and all, he passed the resolution <coughs> um, in order to be, he changed the bylaw to say, okay, we're gonna have new members. And then he proceeded to name the new members. Okay. All members of the Angus, Clouston, Forget, and Morgan families uh, holding certificates of original contribution. And that's what the um, documents are called now. They're called certificates of original um, contribution. They're not, they're not slot certificates um, at all. Okay. Things went along very nicely. The, the, the course did not change at all um, until about 1975. And once again, the reason that the course had changed was a little slave of hand by the government. The provincial government said, well, I'm sorry, um, but in order to classify for tax relief as a golf club, you've got to be 50 acres at least. But the land was only 37.3 acres, and therefore, once again, there had to be some scrambling. Otherwise, you were going to have to pay residential taxes on the, on the land. And this, I read most of the minutes that went on for the next year, but okay, what are we going to do? Okay, so the first thing they did was, it was okay because the Morgan Estate, the Morgan Trust, had land that was just up here, okay? And therefore, they leased some land from the from the Morgan Estate. Okay? But the bigger problem was is that not only did you have to have the 50 acres, but the new land had to be shown to be part of the golf course. You couldn't just buy a bunch of trees and say, <laughs> "Okay, now we're a golf course." Again. And that prompted some wonderful debates: of How are we going to do this? We have got the land. What are we going to do? And the usual comment, and again, appears in many minutes that. Many people felt that the only people who'd be playing golf from those holes would be the mosquitoes. <laughs> Anybody who lives in the Senegal knows that, that you know, uh, one of my friends, when he grew up here, he said, on well, riding bicycle, you get knocked off your bicycle by a mosquito. <laughs> anyway, they did build, uh, they decided it was Cleve uh, Patterson who, uh, whose suggestion was taken, and they built the two new. Two new holes going up here, and, hold on to shoot. and interestingly enough, it is arguable 
that those two holes are probably the two most challenging holes on the golf course today. Certainly the, the one leading from the bottom, bottom right. I know you'll be very interested in this, all you know the golf course. <laughs> With the tee, tee down here, you have to go up and slide down right to the right, and it's a tough par four. And then coming back the other way, it's a par three that's just under 200 yards. So it is, it is uh, it, yeah. of course, from a golfer's point of view, it makes it that much more interesting. So the course is now, eventually, the, uh, the, the uh, Brayside then leased the land for a little while and then bought it from the, from the Northern Estate. And today, this is the golf course, this is the clubhouse, and you can see, if you think back to what was there before, um, it's a wonderful place to be. I recommend to all of you who have not been out there to go and have a look and uh, consider playing some golf there. It's a 249 Centerville Road, and of course, it's lovely to keep it a little bit secret, so most people still don't know where the golf course is. Directly across the road from the what was what was at one time uh, James Morgan's uh, principal mansion basement, and uh, of course it doesn't say anything for a golf course there, so it just is there. So thank you very much. I hope this is good. <laughs>
alongside the golf course here, uh, right up through the Morgan Arboretum and to the Dillinghams. And so we used to ride from the Dillinghams up through the Morgan Arboretum and all through those those paths there. There was, I know there was a, se a series of the, rumors. The, yeah, there were ahead. also huge, um, sorry, huge uh, shows, horse shows okay. that were put on oh, yeah. by yeah. Ian, I think, and, oh, yeah. and others. The Eastern, Eastern Canadian um, Championships. Yeah, and so there were um, cross country I know. I know. When I first began asking about what the history and so on, um, there was this. This a number of people mentioned to me. Oh, we have these cross bunkers that uh, dominate the course. So um, here, uh, if I can pick one out, th this is one. There's a cross bunker here and over here. Um, as a cross bunker, what it means is that these are sand bunkers which go right across a particular hole and these were built of stone they, they, they were they were not finely built stone walls they were made of just rubble they took all the stones and built it and put the sand in front you see and uh, the the argument was oh that's what they were using for jumps you see so i talked to john angus about that and he said was appalled and would do that. <laughs> make a horse jump over a rock wall, you know. <laughs> it was not likely to be the case. Very good. There was some talk that uh, perhaps the sheep were kept um, underneath the clubhouse, the old clubhouse, and that um, it could have been a part of the, the scenery. Yes, indeed. I, my understanding, too, is that some of the early grass cutting could well have been done by sheep. Yeah. 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 Uh, I know Roby, Roby Dahl, who was still a member when I first arrived. He, I guess he was in his 90s at that time, and he was a really good golfer. Um, but he was he worked on the course as a lad, as a, as a, as a caddy and a, and a groundsman. And he said that sometimes they would have the horses wearing pads on their hooves and dragging the mower you know, so that to protect the, to protect the grass, the, the lawns and the, the greens and so on. It would be sort of interesting. My name is uh, Ewan Swan, and I came to the village in 1957 as a six-year-old. And as I grew up, and we get on our bikes, and we ride from the south end of Centerville, in El where I live on Elwood Avenue, and we ride up into North Centerville and explore and such. And I have to confess to you all that back in those days, we used to hide in the woods <laughs> and near the green. And we, if a, if, a, if a golf ball landed on the green, we'd rush out and, <laughs> <laughs> it and hide in the woods again. <laughs> so I, I, I apologize <laughs> for all the former sins. <laughs> Tom Meredith is a good friend of mine. He grew up in, in Sandville, probably not about the same time. And he said they routinely would sneak onto the golf course to play a few holes. I mean, it was it was just a done thing. Actually, most of the time it was empty. So. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, when the, the uh, clubhouse was burned down and what happened with the, per the kids who were accused of doing this? Uh, I can only tell you just a little bit of what of just rumors that I've heard. My understanding was that there were some young people from Centerville um, and they would they would get into the clubhouse and of course at that time there was a wood stove and a fireplace and then they would play around. and I think it was inadvertent I think it got carried away um, I did my understanding was that a lot of people knew who it was but in fact nothing was done in terms of, of action because it was decided they were the children of, you know, probably members of the club and, and very hard to prove those things. So it was, I think it just, you know, went by the wayside. Yeah. Yeah. The, the tower that was there was the attraction for the young people. They would come yes. up to that tower and have a party. Well, that was certainly true in later, in, yeah. in the time that I've been there. I mean, in, yeah. and that was one of the big problems that uh, I don't know if Liz is going to speak to it, but, but uh, the water tower. 
Uh, it was quite, a, it's quite, quite unique, and there was a, a water tower inside, and it was encased in stone. It was sort of a bit of a, of a folly. But in my time there, certainly in, in the, you know, 2010, 2015, um, there was an active website down in Montreal which would say if we're going to have a party and here was it, here's where you go. <laughs> I think the only thing that saved it from being bigger than it was was there was no place to park mm -hmm. on Senegal Road. You don't have a lot of cars parking there. Um, it is it's interesting. Those three lots, of course, are two of them uh, have uh, never been built on, as far as I know, apart from the orchard and, and the downtown. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think George Jersey tried to build something in the old water. Mitchell uh, moved here in 1941. Um, I, I wasn't 20 years old, I was one year old. <laughs> but I uh, started playing Brakeside at, at, when I was seven years old. So I had a lot of fine memories. My great and good buddy, buddy Robert Carswell was president when the uh, fire took place at the clubhouse and he was responsible for finding a new, well, an architect to replace it exactly the way it was. But wonderful memories of mm -hmm. the golf course. I played, my buddy was David Black, who's no longer with us right now, and he lived on Pacific Avenue, and um, he came second in the Quebec Amateur Open uh, because of our playing at, at Crazy Eye Links. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, do you know any more about the Claude family? Who were they, or how did they get there? No. Um, I've seen some of the early documents. They're, they're, they're written in legalese. They're pretty hard to and pretty hard to interpret. He inherited the land from his father, uh, so it's, it was it was part of the Claude family for quite some time. And it was a and I think it had been operated as a you know as a working farm for quite some time because you know you look at the, the the shape, especially less so now, but certainly ten years ago, that the, the fairways roll like this was. Clearly showed that there was farming that had gone wrong. There's a clone family that lived in the Where were their buildings? Where was their barn? Where was their oh, but the, uh, where, where was it, it was right, right beside. Where, where, right, well, where it is is, is <coughs> down here. The, the clone farm was there, and if we look back at uh, at some of the earlier, um, when the, we can see some of the farm buildings. Show you. Okay, here is here is the map, and you can see that when they decided to buy the land, and they mapped out the land they wanted, but you see that that was that was the Claude house, that was their that was their home, and the barn was here, and so when when Jeremy Ruth lived there, they, they the, the old farm, the barn was still there, and still there. it was a carriage house and a barn. So that, 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 barn, was, that, new. that old barn that's still there was this barn. Yeah, the house. Yeah. Yes. The whole house was rebuilt. Yeah, the house has been completely rebuilt. Colonel Wallace was the owner. Yes. Yeah. 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 How many members today? We sort of aim to have 200. We rarely get 200 paying members by the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the aim. Is that the it's sort of common wisdom, I think, that you you don't want to have too many members. So you, you cap it at 200. If you go one or two over, okay, that's okay. But it, we usually find, so we have, as you might guess, it's, it's a senior's course, you know, in inverted commas, it's a senior's course, and therefore us seniors, <coughs> um, we lose a few every year, and then we have to bring in some more. We had some, we had some, uh, Issues with membership. Um, when I was president, there was some 
we had this long waiting list, but people had to wait so long they went elsewhere. And so when you came to look at the waiting list, there was nobody there. So, so there were there were there were some issues like that. But then, we, as often happens, we'd had an influx, and and I mean, George Corey will say this: when you get it, all you need is one couple to come from Beaconsfield, you see, who have had it up to here with all the rules and having to call everyone and had to spend the whole morning, you know. Um, making a time, et cetera, et cetera. So you get one couple coming in and they tell their friends, hey, you can go to Brayside. You can play whenever you want. Nobody is going to be around to tell you you can't do it. If there's someone on number one, you can go to number three. And so and, it's, and it works as long as people are civilized. That's what you need. You need people to be civilized. And we're usually civilized. Okay? Oh, but that's the guy, around 200. When we play, I remember somebody, we play, as I say, pretty well every morning in the summer at daybreak. And sometimes they're just us and the groundskeepers, and sometimes there are one or two other crazies out there too. So it's a lovely place to play. 